Hey everybody, welcome back to Logos-ish. This is John, I'm joined by Garrett and Sarah, and we are gonna jump right in to our conversation to get today. Our guest is Reverend Dr. Grace Jisun Kim, professor of Earlham School of Religion, and we are talking today about Sorry, what? <laughs> Professor of Theology at Earl Hand School of Religion. Sorry. It's my fault. I left it out. Yeah, I just read right off the thing. It was just. Like, you can fast. start again if you want. <laughs> no, no, we're committed at this point. Okay. Uh, today, though, we're talking about your book, right? Hope in Disarray. So, um, would you like Dr. Kim to introduce yourself real quick? Let us know who you are, how you got to where you're at. So, you want me to introduce myself? Yeah, we'd just like to know well, who is oh, okay. Reverend Dr. Grace G. Sunkham. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, as you mentioned, this is my latest book, Hope and Disarray. It just came out. I just received it. And that's my 19th book, which is, um, I never thought I'll write this many books. I said, before I retire, uh, I'll be happy if I write five. Uh, but this is so exciting that this book came out. And so, as you mentioned, I teach theology at Earlham School of Religion and I'm ordained um, in the PCUSA. So excited to be ordained and um, married to a math professor. It's a very different field from what I do and three kids, I guess. I can't call them kids anymore. They're older. So one just graduated from college, one in college and one senior in high school. Oh, so perfect. that's my full and busy life. <laughs> Very much so. Very yeah, much and so. thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be on your podcast. So thank you so much. Yeah, we are so happy to have you today. Uh, we're really excited to be talking about Hope and Disarray in particular. It's been a really fun read for us. We've had a really good time with it. I have so many questions. Uh, we have so many questions that we sent you before uh, hopping on this recording. And I have a couple of ones, you know, we want to ask a little bit about the structure of the book, the major themes of the book and stuff like that. I want to start off, though, by asking the question that is on everyone's mind after they've read your table of contents. And that is, what can Taylor Swift's breakups teach us? <laughs> I love that question. Yeah. And. You know, thinking about, so I've got two boys and a daughter. And actually, nobody really in my family likes Taylor Swift. And I have to say, my husband really detests her. Every time her song's on the radio, he turns it off. But I actually admire her. She's a young woman who is filthy rich, uh, writes her songs, and has made such an impact. So I just, you know, when I write, I think of, uh, things that have actually made an impact in our world. And Taylor Swift, for some reason, people love her music. People um, thrive at, at, or go to wherever, whatever she's doing, people will buy it. And so she's high influential. And when I think about just, you know, I don't listen to her all the time. I don't really know her music inside out, but I know um, she's gone through a lot of breakups. So this is what I do in my spare time when I should be writing. I go and look at celebrity news, <laughs> which is a horrible thing, but it just gets my mind off the really serious things in her life. And I know she goes through a lot of boyfriends and she breaks up a lot. And after her breakup, she writes a song. And I thought, this is quite interesting that she is able to um, have fun with her boyfriend, then go through a breakup, and then she writes a song, and she makes a ton of money from her song. So not all of her songs are from her breakups, but there's plenty enough. So that got me thinking about how she's able to break up with her boyfriend. And then she broke up with, I think, the streaming streaming. Um, uh, site. I can't remember the name on top of my head right now, but she does a lot of breakup and every time she does, she profits off this. And it just got me thinking about how even in our life, um, breakup of marriage, breakup with, you know, I've got young kids, young adults kind of in my household, they're breaking up with people and so forth. And we think all the time we think breakups are really bad. But my piece in the book uh, with Taylor Swift is, Sometimes, if we're in a really bad relationship, particularly abusive relationships, 
then sometimes we do need to break up and get rid of it, whether it be a spousal relationship or friendship or even some other uh, boyfriend, girlfriend um, relationships. Sometimes, and that's how I think about Taylor Swift, she's able to break up and then still go on. Uh, profit from it but we won't be profiting but then she goes on with her life and I think with us too especially if we're in a very abusive relationship it is time to kind of stop there think about it and what where are we going to go how are we going to overcome this and so you know a lot of my pieces in the book um kind of are relation people can relate people you know all around the world know who taylor swift is so if they're gonna they can look at this and go wow a theologian writing about taylor swift i'm hoping that there will be some impact and people will be interested um, because certainly my kids are interested if i write about something from our culture but particularly pop culture they are interested even though they're not going to listen to her music they are interested in you know, on an aside, last year I I got to meet uh, Chance, Chance the Rapper, oh, wow. and my kids were thrilled. I wasn't that thrilled because I really don't know his music, but I know who he is. So I was kind of excited just meeting him, but my kids were thrilled, and they said, "Oh, mom, you are so hip that you got to meet." Him. I am so, so jealous, I, along with them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just thrilled that I got to meet him. So anyway, I just think um, it's, if people can relate to a, a certain person or a topic, then, he, then I'm able to write and I'm hoping that people will be um, touched and moved. And, uh, you know, that Taylor Swift reflection, you know, at the end of a relationship, if we're going to break off the relationship, if we are the abused one, that that won't be the end of it, that there is hope. So the whole book is on hope. And I'm just hoping that people who read it, you know, these are small little nuggets of, I'm hoping some form of wisdom that they, you know, even though they may feel it's the end of something, maybe the end of their life or whatever, that they can still find hope. If Taylor Swift can move on, we can also move on and and possibly grow from our relationship and find hope in God. So, you know, some people, when they think about hope, particularly non-Christians, they may think that it's, a, it's something about just being optimistic, you know, oh, I can be optimistic today, but it's not really about being optimistic. It is really finding hope in God that, mm -hmm there is something more that can happen because God is present in our lives, present in our world, uh, present all around us. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think it's almost basically right on the first page of the book where you talk about hope as an anchor. And that seems to be sort of your central image is, is having that hope for the future and that anchor in God to help us sort of direct ourselves in the messiness of life. Like that yeah. just is a beautiful picture to think about it that way. Um, Thank you. Yeah, rather than maybe thinking about it as just sort of a, a naivete or, or something along mm -hmm. those lines where, you know, yeah. it's, it's just um, a sort of facile kind of, you know, hoping just to hope or being optimistic just to be optimistic. It's intended to be a, a directive sort of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think as Christians and as people who of faith and, and people who are seeking, um, you know, spirituality, that hope is not something, you know, just out there, but it really anchors our life. It is, you know, no one's life is a rose garden. You know, there's thorns in our life, there's hardships. And I think 2020, probably one of the hardest years for many people around the world, not for all, because I know some people are coasting by, but for so many people, it's been hard losing family and friends and getting sick, losing jobs. It's hard. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, part of our life. You know, God never said life will be easy, but life is tough. And 
as we are going through the difficulty and the hardship, it is hope that keeps us going. Hope is something that anchors us, some, something that we hold on to. You know, Jesus talked about hope. There is hope throughout scripture. And I'm sure when you preach on Sunday, I know many of your listeners are clergy. Uh, some are probably seminary students. Um, some are just maybe seeking that, you know, when there is difficulty and problems that we face, still we anchor in hope because that's what God gives us. It's, it's a gift from God that we kind of hold on to. And whenever I, and in the book too, when I talk about hope, it's not just, okay, I'm hopeful today and that's it. It is really, it leads to some form of action too. It makes us kind of walk forward, take another step, uh, leap of faith kind of to kind of to God, that God will kind of move us in the right direction, give us some kind of sense of, um, of hope and peace and love. So, you know, hope is, it, it's something that we all need. And I'm hoping that Christians will seek it and that it will really change our life. So that's kind of what my desire is with the book. And that's what I had in mind as I kept writing the book. Um, and now that it's going to be out soon and you got it in Kindle, I'm very excited that people are reading the book. That's really uh, interesting. And you know, especially thinking about how pop culture influences us so much. I know for uh, the benefit of just having uh, that breakup music or um, sort of brooding music in general is important for, for people um, on, on a slight psychological level in the fact that it provides us emotional validation. Um, and, it, you know, having that emotional validation, I think, um, allows God to work a little bit because our, our defenses are a little bit down or, or like we're, we're honest with ourselves. And I feel like, um, especially in this time, uh, we have to be honest with ourselves. Like, you know, like, like you said, COVID is, um, is really bad or 2020 has just been really brought with a lot of stress. So, um, what does hope look like? Um, this past week I talked about, um, uh, in my sermon, um, and I use an example from when I was growing up at, when Christmases weren't great um, and we, we always didn't have a lot of money. So when they were particularly bad, my sister and I uh, would say, this is the best worst Christmas ever. Um, and then we would, and then we would just crack up for like about 10 <laughs> minutes and we would just enjoy what we had um, because we knew that, you know, really this holiday is not about the presents or the gifts or, or, or the happenstance or the traditions, but about being connected and close to one another. And that's what God does. So God being close and present. Um, and that, it, you know, in that weird sort of way, uh, my sister and I um, just remind ourselves of like the closest closeness and the importance of relationship and being realistic too. So like that was for me, hopeful, uh, so it just kept, you know, making us go forward and not focus on all of the terrible stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I think you touched on a good point. I think we living in the U.S., we're so materialistic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Christmas was never about exchanging gifts, but suddenly it becomes very commercialized. Mm -hmm. You know, Santa Claus becomes the center and kind of we lose our focus of the reason for Christmas and why we as Christians are even celebrating Christmas. So I think you kind of nailed it on the right thing. And be, and society keeps teaching us, you know, if you buy this, you'll be happier. You know, if you just get this in your wardrobe, you'll be so happy and just buy this extra thing and you'll be happy. So we just want more and more things. And we realize that those never, you know, it's, the, the happiest people are not the richest people in the world. Some of the richest people are the most miserable people and you just don't even want to be near these people. So I think, you know, as we live and there is just so much hopelessness in the world, people are losing jobs, people are losing homes now, people are just losing family members. Life is 
very difficult and it's not the material things that we need it is we need god in our lives we need um, spirituality in our lives and god is the one that gives us hope so even you know in our lowest points in our life we still kind of cling on to god and it is god who gives us this hope and when you were talking about your christmases i grew up very poor too we didn't have any christmas gifts uh, when i was growing up so i was always jealous but i think you know it just kind of then centers us um and i hope people who are listening uh either during christmas or other times of the year that it's not the material things that we seek in life it is the spiritual and it is the hope that god gives us that mm -hmm. takes us through every day even in our dread and even in our uh, moments of despair and hopelessness yeah you talk a little bit about advent and christmas in the book and so this feels like a nice way to to sort of segue into uh this it, hope and disarray feels like a slogan for advent <laughs> yeah. generally uh-huh yeah uh, uh -huh. uh so i mean what does advent um what does advent mean to you in I terms of Sorry. Yeah, I guess um, waiting and for the coming of God. So we are all in the season of Advent. We are waiting for the coming of God, which gives us hope. You know, when we think about Christ coming, um, you know, for Christmas, Christ came into the world to give life, to give light, to give love and peace and hope. So every year, kind of as we experience Advent, as we enter Advent, as we are waiting for time of Christmas, we are waiting in anticipation, we are waiting in hope. And, you know, we know Christ is with us, but it's this whole kind of Christian um, calendar kind of ritual of waiting in anticipation and hope. And I think, um, you know, I keep talking about despair. This year has been awful for just me personally. I was in the middle of writing another book and my computer died. So I thought maybe I have all this material saved up somewhere and I didn't. Oh. So four months were um, all gone of several books that I was working on in the, in the laptop. Then all summer I had to work on his old laptop because all these computer tech companies were trying to retrieve it. And after five different companies, they couldn't retrieve it. So I lost everything. Then I lost a family member. Um, then I, you know, my health, I've been very ill for over a couple months now. So this year has been awful, but what sustained me was, you know, still God is present in our lives. And I know I'm not the one that suffered the most. I know of other, so much suffering this year. You know, God sustains us, and in our times of despair, we cry out to God and lament. So we cry out, and we know God is listening. And as God listens, God holds us in our hope, in God's hope. God gives us God's hope so that we can still live through that day, one day at a time, and that we can overcome anything, any hardship that comes to us. So I know, you know, some of your listeners have probably maybe had the worst year of their life. But uh, my wish and desire is that they can lament, cry out to God and seek God. You know, my other book that came out, um, my last book, Imagining Spirit, that the presence of God as spirit is present everywhere. So I know churches, I don't know how your church is right now during COVID, uh, not probably worshiping face-to-face, um, -face. maybe it's through Zoom or some other means, but still, where, however people are worshiping, that still the Spirit of God is present, and the Spirit comes to us and gives us this hope, and that should pull us through whatever hard things that we went through this year or in the past or that we will be experiencing or continue to experience today. 
Um, I know we're getting close to time, but I wanted to ask, um, is hope at risk? And if so, what is, what is putting hope at risk, our hope? Oh, wow. That's a very interesting question. I think there are so many battles that we kind of face today and people, you know, the battles that we face, the hardships that we face, some groups may want to say there is no hope, you know, this is it, just give up. You know, when you read in the news, um, in Japan, in the month of October, more people committed suicide. The suicide was higher than the number of deaths due to COVID all year for Japan. So the suicide rate of one month was higher than the death uh, the, of the Japanese who died from COVID all year long. So people are committing suicide in enormous rates, not only in Japan, in Korea, where I'm, I was born, and all throughout the world. I think somehow there is this message of hopelessness that want to push us down and say there's nothing left. So just give up or commit suicide or do something bad. I think those who, you know, go out and shoot people too, I think that's out of, you know, there's nothing left. I got nothing to lose. I'm going to just kill random people or family members. It's happening. There is, there's death around us. So I think there's these wrong messages that there's no hope. So let's just give up. So I think in the season of Advent and in time of Christmas and just, you know, throughout the whole year, I hope people will know that there is a lot of hope out there and that, you know, if they can't find it in their church or through their pastor, maybe they can find it through a book, through a podcast, through some other writing or through a friend. And I think we as spiritual leaders too, you, you guys are all pastors, um, that's part of our task too, whether it be our preaching or in our counseling, that we can be some beacon of hope. And that hope, you know, the hope always leads to some action. So I'm hoping that, you know, whatever action that we do as ministers, as leaders in the church, or, uh, you know, whatever we may be doing as students, or those of us just in the congregation sitting in the pews that we can share that hope hope doesn't just you know it's not like i hold on to it and it's just mine it's we're not it's not a commercial item it's a gift from god and so you know we as christians and as people of faith are, are called to share this hope with one another and so i'm hoping that even through my book or through sermons, people can experience this hope and, and that it will ignite a, a light in their heart and then they can share it because people are living almost in de very in desperate times. You know, there's nothing left and they're just giving up. So we don't want people to give up. We want to share that hope with with one another, you know, people, because they give up, they turn to drugs or they turn to alcohol, they turn to things that they don't need to, you know, these addictions that people turn to. I think shopping's another addiction. And, you know, during this time of COVID, people, it's so easy to just shop online. It's this addiction that people have, but people can just maybe turn to God, first lament and cry out to God and, you know, God is who gives us this hope. So I hope this is going to be helpful for your listeners. Um, so thank you. Yeah, it's really, it's been a wonderful conversation. And I can definitely say that I think we've all give, given Jeff Bezos way too much money. <laughs> uh, oh, I agree. I'm trying to tell everybody, whatever, don't buy from Amazon. There's other places that you can buy things. Fingers like, crossed. Yeah, it's, Pardon me? Uh, I was just going to say, go ahead. No, he needs to share his wealth. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, fingers crossed, it gets us to Mars faster or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, we got to, he has to share his wealth and he's not, I know his wife is sharing his, her wealth and I'm so happy that she is and, you know, but yeah, he, he's rich and yeah, so we got to <laughs> stop pumping money to him. <laughs> So, so I have one final question. Uh, uh -huh. The book 
going through it, it, it is such a personal book. You have so many personal stories about family, about interactions with things relating to so social justice and ecology and the environment. Um, and one of the core ideas that you present at the very beginning is um, that hope is not just an anchor, but it's also a risk. So can you talk a little bit more about why, you, why you're saying that hope is a risk as well as an anchor? Yeah, so it anchors our life and, you know, hope always leads to some form of action, I believe. So, and sometimes actions are risky. I think, you know, we as Christians, I think one of the biggest issues of our time today is climate change. So I do um, several pieces on climate change near the end. So just to say a little bit more about the structure, um, you know, the first part is living in church and living in culture and then living in relationship. So, you know, it's weird that in America, like half the people are thinking that climate change is not real. You know, which is so surprising to me. So for the rest of us who want to do something about climate justice and saving the environment and doing our part, it sounds a little risky because people shun us. People think we're crazy. You know, we don't need to do that. It's just part of, you know, life cycle. You know, climate change is not human made. It is, and, and scientists have been telling us for years, and that's one of the things that actually scientists even agree on. Scientists don't agree on, uh, agree on a lot of things, but that's one of the things that they actually agree on. So if they agree on that, the rest of us who don't know much about science should heed what they're saying and do take some action. So in that way, it's a little risky. Another more riskier thing is, is you know, this year we saw George Floyd being murdered. You know, we saw it over and over again on that um, video. You know, so many of us, not just here in the US, but around the world. And that, you know, hope gives us life. And that life means we risk part of our life for the sake of others. So it means speaking up. You know, Black lives do matter. It means um, taking a step forward. How can we make this world a more racial justice world so that it's not just, you know, oh, white privilege and, and you know, it's just for the white people, but it's for all people. So it, it, it requires some risk on our part. And as leaders, maybe our church people don't want to be engaged. I think it's just some social engagement. So, hey, we don't need to deal with it. But all these things that I mentioned, they are part of our spiritual life. They are what makes us Christians. You know, God doesn't just say, sit in your little bubble and enjoy life and then, and then die there. It is really going out there and doing something. When we look at the life of Jesus, because I love to talk about the spirit of God, but then everybody's like, oh, you're moving away from the life of Jesus. So let me talk about the life of Jesus. <laughs> you know, when we think about Jesus, he risked a lot too. He, you know, the outcast people of this time were the lepers. He went and healed the lepers, you know, and women were kind of pushed aside. And today still women are, you know, pushed aside. Um, so, you know, we are living in a still very patriarchal world. Jesus welcomed the woman, you know, welcomed the sinful woman at, who was able to anoint Jesus before he died. Uh, talk to the woman at the well. So he did all these risk-taking things. He fed the poor. You know, he, his disciples are like, get rid of them before it's too late, right? But he's like, no, you go feed them. He did all these risk-taking things. And these are just a few examples that I shared. And I think we need to do that. And we could only do that because God gives us hope. So the climate justice that I talk about, the racial justice, the gender justice, all these things that we need to work on. I think we need more men to speak up, risk part of their life, livelihood to speak up for women. You know, I because we need everybody to speak up for the gender justice. You know, women are being killed by abusive people. Women are being abused and women are not being paid equally. There's so much that needs to be done. So I think, you know, we kind of as Christians kind of sit there and go, what risk can I take? 
there's so many things that we need to take. I think we need to work on climate change, the climate justice issue, racial justice, gender justice, you know, the um, sexuality issue. There's so many issues. I know, you know, you guys are United Methodist ministers. That is like breaking up your church. Mm -hmm. So we need people to speak up. And, and speak up for those who have been oppressed or who are oppressed, who are marginalized. We need to do something. And a lot of the time it, it, it's risky and people have lost jobs, um, have, have lost a lot of things speaking up. But I think the hope gives us this risk taking um, acting behavior and action that you know God requires of us to make changes in this world to make it a more just world, not just for human beings, for, but for the animals and the, the birds and, and the trees, the ocean, everything. The, the whole, the world is crying out in pain and agony and the climate change is showing us that the world is. So I think it takes a lot of risk and we individuals, we as communities and we as churches need to take that risk um, and do what God requires of us. Amen. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. We always ask our guest before we conclude, what's bringing you joy right now? You know, the having that connection to joy and celebration, I think fits really nicely in line with the theme of the book and the theme of hope. So uh, mm -hmm. what's bringing you joy right now? So I've been sick for so long. And as I mentioned earlier, this year has been so uh painful for me personally i think like holding this book you know it took me a long time to write it, it gives me joy and i think um uh, you know this pandemic will end you know the vaccines coming out people will be vaccinated and we can control it uh hopefully by summer of 2021 so that gives me hope so i look to the new year and i look to many more years to come with joy in my heart that you know god is still present and god is still working in us and god is not going to give up on us so we don't give up on ourselves and i think we need need each other more than ever and that gives me joy that we can work together and bring joy to others so thank you for what you do in your different ministries. I think podcasts is so important, especially during a pandemic when we're kind of shut in. It's a way to connect with one another. So thank you for that. It was a joy to be on this podcast with you. <laughs> so hopefully we can meet each other again after this pandemic's yes, over. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I would thank love that. Thank you again for being here. If you want to find more from Reverend Dr. Grace Chisun Kim, um, her 19 books are all available online. On uh, Amazon. <laughs> yeah, or, or other, other places. You can, and you can ask your um, neighborhood bookstores to order too. I think, yeah, we, we we got to stop buying from Amazon, though. That's the quickest way. But I think there's Barnes and Noble and Target and other places. And I think local bookstores, we need to support local bookstores. So you can ask your local bookstores to order. And those who are in seminary, your bookstores, too. So you mm -hmm. can get that. And I'm also on social media, on, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all under Grace G. Sun Kim. So you can find me there. And after the whole Joe Biden and that Wall Street you know that I don't know if you've read it with um, <sighs> Epstein writing about doctor. I feel like I'm just gonna put doctor everywhere, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> just to, you know, because I don't like this sexism happening, you know, in this wider world either. But you can find me there, all under Grace Jisun Kim, and my website so you can. Everything is just Grace Jisun Kim. So keep in touch with me. I would love to hear from your uh, podcast listeners. Um, see what they think about the book and maybe they can write a review for Amazon, sorry, for Barnes and Noble <laughs> or write a blog. 